on here, 19. Looks like it's fluctuating. All right, I'm Dr. Zachary Bloom. I'm here in Lawton, Oklahoma. I practice at Legacy Family Chiropractic. I own this business with my sister and I actually started this office when I was in school and I was able to take an off, uh, office from a guy who passed away and turn it into the office I am at now. So I was also in the Air Force at the time all the way going through school. So just to let you know, I have a little bit of different backgrounds. So whatever you guys need out of this talk, this is about you, not about me, not about the brain or the body. This is what you guys need to help be better in chiropractic and understand the science behind it. So I'd really like you guys to join and talk to me, communicate, ask questions, make sure you understand everything going on that I'm talking about. I'm pretty known for going down rabbit holes. We will talk about cellular level stuff that is complete theory. And it's something that I've made up with a couple of friends of mine. So it will go pretty down the rabbit hole. But if you don't understand, just ask me a question, bring me back and we'll make this whole conversation. Everybody okay with that? Start seeing the hearts come in, good deal. All right, make sure that we got this. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. That ought to keep the little sports happy. Yeah. Perfect. As I keep going back to the original. Sorry about this. Let me get my PowerPoint up when it will. Share screen does not want to work for me. Do you guys have this problem on the first one too, where it wouldn't share screen properly? Yeah, she wasn't able to pull it up. Mm. Even Tech difficulties. We just had it working. I know, right? Um, Something I have seen work in the past is if everyone except Zach turns their camera off, sometimes that works. I know I, we just asked to turn the cameras on, but. I'm gonna try to get out of my content here. Let's see if I can pull it up that way. There we go. Is that sharing it now? Yeah. Perfect. Let's see how this presentation goes. All right, use a little Prezi. I don't know if you guys use uh, PowerPoints, but Prezi is the easiest way to make a good presentation. So a little bit different spin. All right, let me shrink this so I can see my slide. There we go. All right, so today we're gonna go over chiropractic science. Again, I can't see the chat, so Zach, if you could let me know if anybody has questions. Feel free to interrupt me at any time. I do not care. Uh, I wanna make sure that you guys get the most out of this talk. So obviously we played pinky in the brain at the beginning of this. This is how the brain connects to the body. If the brain was simple enough to be understood, we would be too simple to understand it. That is one of my favorite quotes right now just because I am diving down into how the brain actually works during the adjustment. And so it really kind of hits home on, we don't understand how the brain works. We don't know where that thought comes from. We don't even know how the healing process really originates in universal and innate intelligence to make sure that our bodies actually accept the adjustment and what happens there. That's still being studied right now and I think it's gonna change four or five times before we even get to the actual process of what the adjustment really does. So what do we do as chiropractors? I want somebody to answer this for me. Anybody out there, what do we do as a chiropractor? I 
All right, Cricket. So I'll just explain it. If uh, we don't have any feedback from you guys, that's fine. I can just talk at you, even though that's what you get at school all day. But uh, if you do participate, this is a little bit more fun for me and you. But anybody want to take a shot at what we do as chiropractors before I just go and talk to myself? I'll take a crack at it, Doc. All right, there we go. That um, restoring motion into a joint, which allows the removal of interference between the brain and the body uh, for that patient. That's a good way to explain it, right? So if you guys aren't readers, right, we have the chiropractic textbook. Almost every basic answer is in here to the extent that even some of the complex answers are in here. If you don't read, I highly suggest you start because I read every day. It advances my knowledge of what chiropractic is and is not and make sure that I can deliver the best care to my patients possible, all right? If I couldn't do that, I would be out doing my Air Force job because it wouldn't be worth anything. But, you know, we de developed a huge clinic here in Lawton, which is a small town, because I read this textbook and many other green books just like it. A little blurb right there about reading. All right. So in this textbook, it actually defines what chiropractic is, right? So we correct subluxations, right? I'm not going to read this definition to you. That's no fun. What I am going to tell you is it is important that you learn how to detect and correct these subluxations instead of just exploring through the spine and popping each segment. You know, there's that saying, pop and pray and hope they pay. That's the worst way to actually practice. You won't build clientele that way. All you'll do is have people come into your office and they'll look for that pop. And I'll tell you right now, not every adjustment has that cavitation in it, right? We should all know that by now we're in school. But if you aren't educating your patients, every time they'll come in and they'll be like, doc, you didn't get it. Well, what if you push that bone further than it needed to? And now you cause an issue bigger than what was the original cause of them coming into the office, right? So that's why we really look at our objective measures and wanna know what's actually going on in the spine to make sure we know how to correct subluxations. Most people don't think that you can see subluxations on x-ray. I'm here to tell you, you 100% can. If you look at this flexion extension view in the lower right, end of your screen. Notice how there's two coupled segments right here stacked on top of each other. And then the segment above it is starting to degenerate. That's because of the subluxation. The bone tries to respond to that movement and it starts to create the osteophyte growing out of the front. Do we all know that now? I think we do. Do I get head nods? All right. Does anybody believe we can't see a subluxation on an x-ray? Nope. Everybody uh, agree? Well, I was going to say, like, I was under the impression the reason, like, they were saying you can't see it is because you cannot definitively infer that there is neurological involvement off of x rays. And so that was, like, my understanding on why it was like you can see indications of where there's probably subluxations, but because you cannot test the, the neurological aspect, and that's what makes it a uh, subluxation versus a misalignment. That was, like, my understanding on it. Agree with that. But what I'm getting at is that you're seeing the bone respond, that there's lack of moment, movement in the spine, and that lack of movement is creating the degeneration. So, okay. yes, there could be no x-ray finding and you still have a subluxation. But if you have an x-ray finding, there 100% is a subluxation. Okay. Does that make sense? Would you say that um, finding... A subluxation in X-ray means it's like a chronic. It's been there for it's been there so long that it's like affecting the bones. You know what I mean? Correct. Like, yes. So this means it's at its chronic phase, not acute phase. And then I even have over here a complete subluxation or a complete luxation right here, which is a complete dislocation, just as fun, right? So this isn't a subluxation. This is not a chiropractic case. This is an ER visit.
right? So we want to make sure we understand that we see this so we know that if this comes in the office, you're not adjusting that, you can't replace that. We are trying to make sure that this patient is even okay because that spinal cord might be even severed at that point. They need to go to the ER, right? This actually walked into my office. Not this exact film, but something along this line. And he walked in from a car wreck. So you wanna be able to be aware that if you adjusted this without taking x-rays, you could possibly kill him. So, so are you suggesting that we should be x-raying every single patient that walks in? I believe that you need to take objective measures, whether they x-rays, uh, EMG, whatever form of objective measure that you resonate with in your office to make sure that you find a subluxation, not that you're finding a misalignment. Okay. So I don't just use x-ray in my office. I have several other tools that I use. X-ray is just the easiest for me to use for patient education. Okay. Heart rate variability is my second go-to. And I just started adding that into my office. And that's a whole nother talk we can go down on object objective measures. But the main point in here is when you're looking at x-rays and then you get your hands on the patient, you're not looking for the luxation that's over here. You're looking for the subluxation and making sure you correct it. Now, how many of you have broke down what subluxation means? Have you broke down the word ever? So luxation meaning light, sub meaning less than, so when we say we're restoring the brain to the body, we're connecting that light, right? So that energy is really important that we, that energy is really important that we restore into the body. Now here's a thoracic film. Um, same thing, I'm not gonna bore you by looking at a bunch of x-rays, but we can see it on every level of the body, right? Now, I do focus mainly on the atlas, right? I do a technique called NUCA, where I believe that if I correct the major subluxation, the minors will correct themselves out. But there are cases where the major subluxation is in the low back, in the thoracic spine. So I use my objective measures to find that. And when I find those subluxations, I correct them. And I have multiple different ways I do in my office. Would you mind so, describing a little bit about NUCA? Just, we're not even remotely mentioned NUCA at Parker, so just kind of fill people in. Okay. Uh, NUCA is one of the most scientific uh, researched techniques in chiropractic, right? There's CBP, there's TRT, there's activator, you know, and NUCA. They are some of the most that publish different research papers. NUCA is a very light force technique that addresses the atlas to make sure that the atlas is under the head orthogonally to create a good Y and X axis, which will relieve pressure off the brainstem to make sure that it flows properly to the body. All right. Now, NUCA is as simple as it's complex, right? I'm moving the atlas into its ideal position, reestablishing movement, but it takes a very complex system to make it happen, which I like to say that takes a life to, uh, lifetime to really truly understand, right? But it's as easy and you could start it in school by going to a couple of seminars, which Nuka, a little blurb, there's two seminars. One's in Minnesota and the other one is in Southern California. I highly suggest the Minnesota one if you go, even though Southern California is fun. So is Nuka, uh like strictly upper cervical or does it have other techniques down the spine? It only deals with the atlas sitting on top of C2 and the occiput relationship. All right, cool, thanks. You're welcome. All right. So now that we understand what subluxation is, we're gonna go into some new ideas about what subluxation is, all right? So when I talk about how you need to be specific when you're adjusting, it's really important that you understand you're having an energy exchange with your patient. So this is where we're gonna start going down a rabbit hole, all right? 
And if you tune me out, you know, no judgment, but this is where the level of a subluxation and how to correct it really kind of comes in. Okay. So you have to prepare yourself and your mind before you start seeing patients. It's really important that you have a clear headspace and know what you're going to do and plan out your whole shift before you even start seeing patients. Because if your mind's not right, I guarantee you'll have trouble when actually patients are coming in and their worst cases are coming on. And let's say that you're starting to adjust patients. You get a headache case after headache case after headache case, right? Which happens every day in the office. Well, by the time you hit lunch, you have a headache and you don't know why. It's because you had an energy exchange with each one of your patients that brought that headache on you. Does that make sense to everybody? Right? Why that happens, and this is where it starts to get into our, the theory that I've kind of came up with with some other friends of mine who are also chiropractors, that we all understand that cells produce a different frequency, right? Every cell in your body is producing a frequency. That frequency is what communicates and tells the brain what it needs. So if I'm really hungry for more salt, my cells will vibrate a certain frequency to tell my brain, hey, I need more salt. And then you consume salt and it starts the whole path, right? Which you learn in school. The reason why this starts to get down a rabbit hole is because there has to be something that produces that frequency. My theory is that at every center of every cell you have in your body has a black hole in it. So in the middle of that black hole or in the center of that cell is a black hole that produces energy and sets a different frequency. The reason it doesn't absorb that complete cell is because it's bouncing off another cell next to it, that frequency balances it out. So cancers can be described this way too, is when their frequency gets messed up, they start reproducing and have a higher frequency and make sure that they start to survive and then the cancer thrives and the host dies. Did I keep everybody there or did I lose you? Still good, okay, good. So what we do as chiropractors, and this is what's most important about my lesson to you guys is that you have to look at everything through a chiropractic lens. Throughout your whole school, every anatomy class, every physiology, you can look at through a chiropractic lens. That lens tells you that our bodies are smarter than we know and that we're smart enough to understand that. And how we do that is we look at the different frequencies going on throughout the whole body and we try to reestablish it to make it go to homeostasis, right? So if those black holes get off, that's when energy goes and death follows, all right? So that sounds really scary, right? But it's not because energy can't be created nor destroyed, correct? So that black hole, when it needs energy, it calls the universe to give it to it. And the same thing is when it doesn't need it anymore, it gets rid of it. I think there's something called the uh, supply and demand or demand and supply, which I like to say it as, right? So your body is demanding energy. Where does it get it from? The universe. How does it get there? Through the cells and how they produce different frequencies. Now you won't want to understand how the brain works. Same thing, demand and supply. If we demand more of our brain, it will supply more energy to us and then we will be able to be better. We will be able to live more optimally. So what's the adjustment do? It reestablishes the frequency to make sure that we can live more optimally. That's simple, right? So any questions on that? So it's almost like we're hitting the, uh, as, the as the chiropractor, it's almost like we're hitting the reset button on that patient. Exactly. What we need to do is find and correct the subluxation. And then it sets, 
if the body accepts the adjustment, that's another thing that you have to be sure of is you're not doing the adjustment. The patient is doing the adjusting because their freak frequency needs to be reset, right? So you nailed it there. We are hitting a reset button to an extent. Which is also why we have to be so specific because you don't want to hit the wrong button, so to speak. Yeah, and then you can go into sympathetics and parasympathetics when you adjust somebody who's sympathetic in your office and you hit all their sympathetics and wonder why they freak out. Um, have you ever been to a chiropractor and they start with your thoracics, then go to your lumbars, then go to your neck, then maybe hit an ankle, an elbow, and then hit your thoracic again some other way and you start to feel your heart pumping, a little anxiety, and you're like, oh, I'm starting to sweat a little bit. Did he you know, do everything I needed? Do I need something else? Why am I sweating right now? Oh, that must've been a good adjustment to hit there. You know, it could have been what you needed, but I like to suggest he might've overwhelmed your system. So it's freaking out and it needs to reset itself. Now, if that's the right or wrong thing, I don't know. I don't have my objective measures to tell you, right? So one thing while you're in school is you're going to be adjusting each other. It happens all the time. You guys will mess each other up. My spine completely jacked after school. Still is, if you look at my x-rays, I got some crazy findings because we just went hell Mary on each other and was like, oh, there we go. Let's send it. Not the best idea, right? When you're in school, you need to be practicing your objective measures to make sure that you're actually hitting a segment you need. That's where the art comes in, right? BJ says the most important part of the art of chiropractic isn't the adjustment. It's the palpation. And that's in the art of the adjustment. All right. So, of course, eating healthy, right, is good for you, but it's not what's going to reset the system. What is, is making sure that our mind can tell the body what it needs so we can feed it properly, right? And then we'll do the reset. And so you can't have a positive life and a negative mind. So school gets really rough for you guys. Test happens and we may have a couple failed tests, but we'll never prevail if we keep a negative mind. So I want you guys to remember that as you see patients, as you are out in the world, you're about to be chiropractors and it is super important to be a light in your community. And if you have any questions or need anything, I'll send my number and email out and it'll get to every one of you guys. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And that's all I got for you. Uh, about palpation, are you into motion palp, static palp, tonal? Like what are you doing to identify your subluxations aside from x-ray? Uh, all of the above. So if you just use one of the tools in your box, you'll never find what you need. So it depends on the patient, right? I do mostly static palpation and motion palpation, but I also am continuously watching the tone of their body, right? Everything I just described about frequency is what equals tone. So if we didn't have tone in our body and those frequencies going within the cells, we would be a puddle of mush on the ground. Tone's what keeps us upright. Tone's what makes us move and our bodies to be able to adapt to how we're moving around. If um, like say that proprioception, right? Is all due to how much tone I have in my body. So that's where the communication comes through. Cool, that makes sense. Okay. Any other questions for me? With you being so new into practice, do you have any tips for? most of us that are graduating soon or just any, any little nuggets. 
Yeah, the first thing you need to do before you even get into office, right? I didn't have that ability, uh, especially being COVID, but build your network. Now, if that's social media networking, I suggest face-to-face -face networking. The more you put your face out there, the more people will recognize you. And heck, we're all beautiful people. We're chiropractors, right? They will want to come into you and they'll recognize you. So first network. Um, second, you're in school right now. I said earlier, be you know, aware of you're adjusting each other, but you have to build your art. If you can't deliver the goods, people won't come back, right? So if you get 20 new patients and only five come back, there's one of two things. Either you really suck at your communication and you need to work on your day one, day two, or you can't deliver the goods. Did you have any other favorite uh, uh, favorite books that you liked other than like the chiropractic textbook? Any that uh, really off the top of your head that you refer back to quite often? Um, top five. Of course, the chiropractic textbook being number one. Uh, the Glory of Going On, number two. Number three, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Gold. Read that two or three times when you're out through school. Reality Check by Dr. Uh, Heidi Havoc. Another really good one. Um, what other ones? Ego is the Enemy. That one basically changed my whole perception of myself, which was super important right before I started practice. Um, right, that's by Ryan Holiday. What other book would I recommend? Meditations is a really good one. Um, it's kind of makes you think a little bit about life as you go into practice. If you take it from the chiropractic lens, like I was talking about earlier. So you can turn anything into chiropractic. You just have to look at it as a chiropractor should. So as you, uh, as you tackle each day, what do you do to prepare yourself mentally and energetically when you prepare to, you know, encounter and transfer energy with your patients? That's Carly, right? Okay. There we go. I like to look at people when I talk. Um, so every morning I have a morning routine. It doesn't change. Every practice day I do this. I wake up, I go to the gym. I get as fatigued as I possibly can. I lift, get a good pump, run in that order. Then I read every morning, it doesn't matter. If it's educational book, my Bible, or uh, a book for fun. Mostly it's educational though. Like uh, at least once a quarter, I read the chiropractic textbook or one of the green books. But right now it's been the chiropractic textbook just because every time I read it, something new pops up that helps me with patient education, which I find essential because that's how you get patients back. Uh, after that, this quarter, I'm on reality check for the second time through. And that helps me describe subluxation to the layman, right? Uh, and gets the research side into it. After I read, I meditate. I visualize my day and whatever thoughts that come from my visual, visualization, I write down and then I journal and then I go and I sit in my office, which I, that's where I am right now. And I make sure that I have everything ready, set out and go. And then I visualize that exact morning, how I want it to go. That's my whole morning routine. Thank you. So Dr. Bloom, what does a typical day in your office look like? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so I just described the morning routine. Uh, after I'm in my office, I log in, of course. I look at all of my um, new patient lists first. Then I look at my day twos, which is the ROF. 
and I go over every x-ray before I start. I make sure that all my ROFs are planned out. I have every x-ray lined out. That way I can just click on my computer and go to the next one as I'm going through. So I use innate in my office, which I don't know if I'd highly suggest, but you know, find whichever uh, electronic health record works for you. And platinum's a pretty good one, throwing a little key in for them. Set up your system, that way you know your flow. So then after I go through all my ROF paperwork and everything and have it all set out and ready to go. I, by that time, the first patient should be walking in the door and I start seeing patients. And I'm a pretty high pace. Um, I saw 63 today, right? So for a new doc, that's not too bad. Uh, I'd like to get to 100 pretty soon, but I start seeing patients and my CA is in complete control at that point. So I'm a firm believer that there's three jobs in a chiropractic office. You have the business owner, the chiropractor, and the office manager. The chiropractor is two of those jobs most of the time, right? The third is the office manager. You have to switch roles from business owner to technician at that point as the chiropractor and let your office manager run the shift. She does everything. She tells me where I need to be next, what I need to do next, and how to progress to keep a flow in my office. And I have to listen to her. There's no arguing at any point during the day. I save that till the end. If I have any grievances with her, I write it down and I have an ongoing list. And then I take care of that at the end of the shift. Does that answer your question? Yes, it did. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Deal. So I, had two I have a question questions. following that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, what oh, go ahead. book is that referencing? Right, where, did, where, where is that information from that regarding the business owner, chiropractor, and office manager? Uh, is that from somewhere or uh, you just heard it from somewhere and you've taken it and run with it? Hang on, it'll come to me. Book yourself solid. I and have uh, it right here sitting next to me. Perfect. Yeah. If you're in your last year of school, you need to work your way through Book Yourself Solid. That I think has been made me so successful because I worked out so many kinks that I came into when I was first in practice, even though that wasn't that long ago. I worked through most of my kinks just because I went through that booklet. So I already knew who my ideal clientele was. I knew who I was going to market to. I knew how I was going to communicate to different patients as they came in because I knew how, who I was going to attract and what I wanted. E-Myth uh, is, oh, e is also sorry, is also a really good one that kind of is in the same vein. Um, I thought follow up question. Now, did you do the workbook as well through the book or you just read the book? Oh, if you read the book and don't do the workbook, it's pointless. Perfect. Got it. Thank you. So I had two quick questions. The first one was on you're talking about how your patient or your typical day looks and stuff. Um, and you're saying you're at the in the sixties and hope, hopefully to get to a hundred. Uh Obviously, with like the upper cervical stuff, we have talked about like before. I was just curious on if you actually have your patients rest there after the adjustment, or how do you approach that? My patients do a three-minute rest on an IST intersegmental traction table, and they can rest up until ten minutes before my CA will go check on them. Okay, so I do cool. have like a cervical. Uh, and, yeah, and then my. Uh, my next question, I guess, would have been with uh, on the NUCA. So what was it that has made you like go more NUCA versus like your Blair, HIO, or NHS and stuff like that? Uh, feedback. When I'm adjusting somebody NUCA, it's not one thrust into the patient. It's a multitude of tricep pulls. That's a very low force technique that I get feedback from every pull I do. 
So I can feel the head and C2 rotating on top of each other to make sure that Atlas sits in the perfect position. So that's where the art comes in of chiropractic, right? You have to know how your hands are delivering the goods. Okay, interesting, thank you. And that's my personal, you know, I personally like that feedback, right? It's not that I don't ever toggle patients because I have a toggle table, but I just don't use it because I can't feel the feedback as well. Now, if you develop yeah. that skill, you can. So it, it's whatever you resonate with. You're the chiropractor, you're the doc. The technique is how you can resonate with each patient. Yeah, for sure. Because I know we've talked a little bit about how you said you've done a little bit of Blair and stuff like that, but mainly, or from my understanding, it was a majority of the NUCA from the upper cervical wise. So yeah, I, I went through every upper cervical technique in school. I was lucky enough to graduate from Life West where we could do pretty much anything we wanted in clinic. I, I, I say that, but I got to explore a lot of techniques, right? So I explored every upper cervical technique. I had three upper cervical docs that fed into me the whole time. And throughout that, I just happened to resonate with Nuka. Okay. Are you transitioning now more into strictly Nuka or do you also utilize full spine? I'm about 50-50 right now. So I kind of want to keep it at 50-50 as well. Uh, I like that aspect. I have a good flow with it that way because Nuka patients do take a little bit longer, but I uh, have a very good CA who puts me in schedules very well. So it completely depends on what they come in with, right? You know, not every patient's gonna resonate with Nuka or allow me to even do it on them. And I like having several tools in my tool case that I can use. So it definitely depends on what I feel when they first come in, what measures they come up with positive. And, you know, I was doing Nuka on every vertigo patient, but I just had two that didn't respond to Nuka. So I had to switch to a full spine. So just knowing your patient and the big deal is like, I saw them 12 visits before I switched 12 visits in Nuka. It's kind of a lot. I should have switched a lot sooner. I learned from that mistake. And if you're not connecting with that patient a certain way, you better switch it. You better have other tools in your case or you refer out. That's another possibility. I'm kind of in a small town. So if I was in California where there's all sorts of docs, I would be straight Nuka hands down but there's not anybody like that here. So it's kind of hard to refer back and forth to other chiropractors when, you know, there's some good ones in town, but none of them do anything like that. Do you use any modalities on top of adjusting or are you just, uh, do you strictly adjust? The IST table is considered a, a modality. That's it. And I use it more as a rest, to be honest. Like they put it on there, they like how it feels, but it's mainly so they're resting after the adjustment. How did you end up in a small town in Oklahoma? Did you pick it for a certain demographic or do you have other ties there? No, I, uh, a friend of mine passed away and his office I purchased when I was in school. So I'm originally from Oklahoma. I thought I'd never come back. I was very much set on actually going to Florida and practicing NUCA under a chiropractor there. But when this guy passed away, I was one of two people that could have stepped into the role. And this is a military town and I'm in the military. So I resonate with the people very well. So it was a smart business move. All right, thank you. Sacred geometry. Kyle, you look like you have a question. 
do you how do you do your payments do you do insurance or cash only or and if so like how did you choose that so i took over this office that was pre-existing uh it is an insurance office i will say oklahoma is the best state to practice with if you take insurance so the money game is definitely there i just pulled my uh 2019 record or 2020 records can't even know what year it is and it was 65% cash. So it was 90% uh, insurance before. So I don't know if that's just how I talk and that's what I pull in or what, but it was kind of interesting to see the numbers at the end of the year that it was a uh, 65% cash. Maybe that's because the insurance doesn't pay anymore and it's a scam, but who knows? I would highly suggest you look at your state. Um, you know, if I was to practice in Colorado, 100% cash, wouldn't mess with insurance there, would be a waste of my time. Same thing with California, 100% waste of time. But here in Oklahoma, Kansas, insurance the way to go. Unless if you have an, like a pure upper cervical office, then I probably do cash again. What about those states or um, like what about those areas are making the decision for you cash versus insurance? If you're elaborate you just on. have to look at the state and see what normal insurances do and like what other chiropractors are doing. So that also depends on who you pick as a mentor. You should be looking for a mentor at your whole school. Who do you want that you resonate with? And even then pick five, 10, 15, but they better give you one-on-one -on -one attention if they're a real mentor. Now, I will say there's coaches. That's different than a mentor. Kind of eating my own foot there. Because if you pay for a coach, don't expect him to be in your daily life. Coaches don't hold hands. Mentors do. Well, this has been really awesome. And unless anyone has any other questions, I think we can slowly start wrapping it up. Um, thank you so much for for taking some time out of your busy week and, and talking with us and sharing sharing all the knowledge you have and you know, elaborating Absolutely. on it. It was my pleasure. Uh, I love doing this. Again, uh, I'll, most of the guys with DSC on their shirts there have my phone number. If anybody wants to reach out, chat about anything, feel free to text me, reach out. We'll set up a time. I'll put a hour, two hours, depends on what you guys need. And we can talk anything out, right? That's how most of these ideas turn into reality. So feel free, get my number. Uh, I don't let people shadow in my office, but you can come check it out on um, my days off. I can show you my flow. I'm not too far from you guys being in Lawton, about three hours north. So anything you guys need, just let me know, you know, we're a small profession. We need to make sure that our young are successful so we can see the masses. Thank you. Yeah, we, uh, we appreciate you, Doc. We appreciate all you guys for logging on for, uh, for day one of Delt Week. 